You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Hey, welcome back to Shoein', everybody. We are so glad that you are here. I'm your host, Matt Priest, and I am joined by Sabria Butler. Sabria, it's great to have you back on Shoein', my partner in crime, as we have another exciting episode. Uh, Sabria, this is Black History Month. It is the start of February. We're in 2022. And with that, we have a number of exciting things that we want to talk about as an organization. But before we get there, we want to bring in one of our key leaders who is critically important to the health and well-being of the FDRA as a whole, but also some of the key initiatives that we're focused on. Uh, And that is Brandis Russell, who's Vice President of Global Footwear at Converse. Uh, Brandis, welcome to Shoe and Show. We're so glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us on today's program. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Sabria. So excited to be here with you all and have this conversation. Yeah, and thanks a ton for coming on uh, the Shoe and Show, Brandis. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. Um, so the first question right out the gate um, is, what is your shoe story? How did you get into the footwear industry? So, Sabria, my shoe story actually started um, with curiosity, um, where I was working at a previous company in my past life. Uh, I was on the sales side of how product came to the market. Um, I worked with sales with the buying team, and we were constantly trying to figure out how to make the footwear and apparel hook together when we were building assortments and uh, we were working with the buyers. And I had a curiosity of like, well, it's got to be easier than this. Like the, the color patterns aren't matching and the flows aren't synced up. Like, how can I figure out how to how to change this process? And so it truly and uh, started with a curiosity where I wanted to learn the process of creation and I wanted to figure out how to make that combination and connection of footwear and apparel feel much more seamless um, than what I was experiencing on the receiving end at that time. Um, I would also say my shoe story is connected to that desire and passion to create. Um, I learned very quickly that I enjoyed being part of the origin stories of creation. And I like being at the heart of catalyzing what was next um, in whatever we were creating, Um, whether it was inspiring consumers to rediscover a favorite shoe that might have been in the back of their closet or introducing sneakers to new or emerging or new audiences. I really enjoyed working with a team of tinkerers, um, of creators, of enthusiasts to imagine what was possible. And um, I learned that quickly. I didn't know that at the time, but I learned that quickly in my journey. And I'd say the, the last thing that I would tie to my shoe story is that I had clarity on what filled my cup. And when I say fill my cup, I often think about how things make me feel and the work that I'm doing, um, because I think when we feel full, um, we're able to bring out the best of what we do. And that also becomes contagious for those around us. And what I didn't realize, but in looking back, um, I love the balance of art and science. Um, I had a econ, I graduated as an econ major and an English minor. Um, and I always just had an affinity for connecting, you know, thought, strategy to poetry, <laughs> to self-expression, um, even to curiosity, which is cre- I think believe is filled with creativity as well. Um, and so the work of um, being in the shoe industry and, and the roles that so many of us are in are daily navigating and threading the needle between finding that beautiful balance between the art of what we do as well as the science of what we do. So those have just been common themes in my shoe story. And um, when I started, um, but even as I continue in this journey today. So what is the role that you serve currently at Converse? Uh, Tell us a little bit about what you do now. 
So simply put, I'm the VP of Global Footwear at Converse. Um, And in my role, I'm tasked with leading a team of a lot of diverse and creative people, as I was saying. Um, I look at the team as a group of dreamers, builders, creators, um, and we are pretty much responsible for developing the company's consumer-led approach to footwear creation. So what I mean by that, um, we develop the strategy, we partner with design to bring product briefs, as we call them, to life, and our development teams work very closely with our partners overseas to actually execute that vision in physical form. Um, So essentially, when you see a shoe from Converse online or in a store, our team has played a role in conceptualizing and creating that product. So Brandon, since the pandemic has started, how do you feel as though your role has changed? And um, with the new year, what are your priorities? Um, First and foremost, as we've all been experiencing, the, the pandemic has fundamentally had an impact on the way that we live and as an extension, the way that we work. Uh, One of the most poignant sentiments I read early in this pandemic was uh, from Jerry Lorenzo. And he said, the biggest loss in the end is if we come out on the other side of this unchanged. Um, And that sentiment really challenged my mindset. Um, And what I felt like he created was an invitation. You can choose to focus on what you've lost or you can choose to focus and be more intentional and seeking out what actually stands to be gain <laughs> and, and how we could all use this moment as an opportunity for growth and also a necessity to innovate. And so um, what my priorities are for this year are very much connected to the things that I've learned personally as well as professionally um, through the pandemic. And I'd say first and foremost, just putting a greater focus on wellness, mental, physical, and emotional. I mean, so many of us live supercharged lives. We're balancing so many dimensions of life simultaneously. I know personally, I was not the best (laughs) at prioritizing um, my own just wellness. And so I've recommitted to putting that at the first. I did it well for my son, but I wasn't doing it well for myself. And so um, heightening that focus for myself, I I believe, has also made me more credible in heightening that for my team as well. Um, As a team, we've been focused on building more resiliency to change. Um, If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that change does not have a period at the end. It actually has a comma and sometimes a dot, dot, dot. So it's always going to come and we aren't going to be able to predict it, nor should we spend time trying to predict it. But what we can spend time doing is figuring out how we become more resilient to weathering it. Um, And that change always seeps in through personal and professional dimensions. Um, The third thing that the pandemic um, taught me and is also an increased priority at work is how do we increase the efficiencies in how we work? Um, working smarter, um, shifting our meeting culture, driving greater prioritization. Uh, we have not mastered this yet. Let me be clear, because my team's probably listening, like, we still have a lot of work to do. <laughs> but we are having more conversations about letting go of what no longer serves us and um, putting a greater emphasis on that. And I'd say that the last thing that has stood out in just so many team conversations um, and that the, what the pandemic has taught us is that it's humanized us all. Mm-hmm. When you're experiencing health challenges, social challenges, racial crises, all at the same time, uh, we were definitely forced to reckon with the blurring of the, our work persona and our life persona. Mm-hmm. You couldn't hold these two things separate, right? Um, we were all up in each other's living rooms, <laughs> kitchens, bedrooms, <laughs> kids yelling. I mean, off mute, telling my son to finish his home. It humanized us Mm. and it made us so much more intimately involved in each other's lives as we were supporting each other through sickness, either our own or in our families, distress, fatigue, fear, frustration, in some cases, burnout. 
And so um, if I take it back to the sentiment that Jerry shared and that invitation that he created, how can we not all leave more changed from this? And if we don't wrestle with how this experience can make us more empathetic, more sympathetic, and more open to being vulnerable, then we've collectively missed an opportunity um, to, to heighten our human condition um, as a collective. So. Mm-hmm. So as you talk about kind of beyond your role at Converse, Brandis, one of the things that's really important for us, selfishly speaking, is that you are on our board at FDRA and you're helping us strategize around our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Uh, you drove our partnership with Inroads, which we were proud to announce last year as an alum of the Inroads program. Uh, and you're helping us establish a robust resource center for companies What makes FDRA uniquely positioned to take on some of the collective opportunities the industry faces when it comes to representation um, and talent development from your perspective? Yeah, I, you know, truly believe, Matt, the beauty of what you have been at the helm of and Sabria, what you're also part of leading the charge on is that FDRA brings together change agents Um, across all of the major footwear brands and retailers. And so when you think about that, um, the intersection of these companies actually have the ability to move the industry forward in a very positive way. And similar to the approach FDRA has taken to sustainability, where it's pushed it as a critical business priority and have become, you know, advocates for industry advancement. Um, I believe that FDRA has the ability to put that same weight behind DE&I and, you know, really um, evangelize the the level of importance and potency for companies that DE&I has on not just their people priorities, but as well as their business priorities. Um, I do think it's important to acknowledge that many of these companies have and have are and are taking positions um, against systemic topics like DEI and the work Matt that we've talked about is how do we help catalyze that, share it, scale it, and um, you know create blueprints that can join the actions um, of the industry together. Um, maybe it's a little bit trite, but I do believe that we are better together. Um, and I think about the work that you all have been doing with Dr. Dwayne Edwards, mm. um, you know, really pioneering uh, with FDR to build FDRA to build a space for community and bring Black voices across the industry um, together. That was a really meaningful and powerful first step. Um, and so what I look forward towards the future is how do we further that work um, and continue uh, to work towards meaningful change as a collective? Yeah, I love that, Brandis. Um, I'm very proud of what, what we established in February of 2019. You were, uh, you were a part of that, that first gathering of the African-American Footwear Forum in Washington, D.C. Uh, this being Black History Month, though, we want to talk about the, the present and the future, as you just referenced, Uh, and what we plan to do collectively as an organization uh, starting this month and moving forward. And so we have some really cool announcements that we want to lay out there for the community to digest and socialize and start to get very excited about as we are. Uh, One is the African-American Footwear Forum is changing its name to the Black Footwear Forum. Uh, We thought as we conversated around uh, the importance of being more inclusive to black and brown employees within our industry and making sure that we weren't just creating a singular kind of definition as to who would qualify to be in this really important group. We wanted to be more inclusive while at the same time maintaining the four walls of the of the structure of the Black Footwear Forum as a place for um, black employees to come as a community and gather and, and network and build relationships and to create and thrive and explore uh, opportunities to grow together. Uh, So that's announcement number one. Um, Equally as important is ensuring that we have a group of professionals that are committed to the importance of the Black Footwear Forum and providing us key advisory um, and guidance and wisdom, which every organization should tap into for sure. And so the establishment of an advisory committee or an advisory board is something that we're very proud to announce a represent representatives from Puma and Nike and Morgan Stanley and uh, and uh, Converse and Adidas and and other and RG Barry are coming together to help guide us through 
decision making from when do we gather, where do we gather, uh, how do we set up regional chapters and cities of key importance. So that's something that um, that we're very excited about. And then last but certainly not least is the reemergence of gathering in person, something we are all waiting for. The magic that was in the room in February of 2019 in D.C., subsequently after that in Portland in August of 2019, uh, we haven't been able to tap into during the COVID era and we want to get back to it. And that means an in-person event later this year in Detroit in partnership with Dr. Dwayne Edwards at the Pencil Lewis College of, of Business and Design. So more to come on that. But I just want to get your take on some of these cool initiatives and changes that we're, that we're making in the announcements, uh, this announcement that, uh, that I've laid out there for you. No, I mean, I'm super excited. And and to your point, um, the advisory board and the voices that we brought together in that space were equally energized um, for being champions of the work that we know we'll need to continue to do together. Um, Having the opportunity to participate in D.C., Matt, I know you heard from a lot of folks there. I mean, it was honestly like a family (laughs) reunion. (laughs) So many of those people had worked together. Um, you know, the had crossed paths, um, hadn't seen each other in a few years. So it was just so energetic in the room. And to your point, being able uh, to do that in person and, and do that on the grounds of what uh, Dr. Edwards has built at the Penn Sol Lewis College of Business and Design is going to be such a special uh, moment. Um, so the last question. Um, so with all that we're doing with uh, the Black Full Reform, um, what is your vision for the next year? Where do you see us um, moving forward in the future? So, um, you know, what, what I've recognized over my 20 plus years and just work life is that uh, lasting change takes time. And so, you know, over the the next year, what um, I believe is going to be important to continue to pay attention to and advocate for is that that progress that has started isn't stalled. Um, I hope to continue to see progress by each company towards the commitments that honestly they are making on behalf of their employees and that they're equally making on behalf of future generations of talent. Um, And so just having a continued focus on representation um, and key leadership roles and continuing to see um, more people within the industry become champions of change is what I'm looking forward to this next year and partnering with both you, Matt, and the members of the FDRA um, to continue to advance that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so important, and I'm honored and privileged, Brandis, that you uh, have devoted your time, energy, and commitment to to this organization and helping guide us to do what's right by our industry. Our, our industry deserves a robust approach, a collective approach to diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, our Black employees deserve the Black Footwear Forum in service to them to help them thrive, grow, and create opportunities for personnel development. For It's just... When I hear about the connections that are made, um, the businesses that are established, the relationships that are established, the uh, just based on the gatherings we've had to date over the last few years, I'm blown away about how uh, that organization is being used to to empower uh, Black professionals in our industry, and they deserve no less. And so, thank you so much for coming on the program today to talk about um, these initiatives, talk about your shoe story. Um, for those of you who don't know, Brandis and I grew up basically two miles apart and didn't know it at the time, <laughs> oh, but wow. now we're, uh, we're BFF forever because of that, but also because <laughs> okay. of the work that we're doing with the Black Footwear Forum. So Brandis, thank you for coming on Shoe and Show. We're super grateful for your time today. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Sabria. Thank you. Folks, this has been another exciting episode of the Shoe and Show. Uh, we hope that you will continue to listen, particularly as we make our way through the month of February. Uh, here in 2022. It is Black History Month. We're going to be focusing all all month long on those voices and thought leaders and creatives that are helping to guide our industry, uh, not just for Black professionals, but for all of us who are in this industry. And we're grateful for their leadership. So please tune in next week for another exciting episode. In the meantime, there are well over 300 episodes now in our catalog. Go to shoeandshow.com to access each of those. Uh, And until next time, on behalf of Brandis, Sabria, and myself, Shoe and Show is out.
Chew In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.